بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله والسبي أجمعين أشهد لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد الله وأشهد أن محمد النبي والرسول ما بعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Okay, what I'll do, I'm going to have to do a simultaneous translation because my native language, of course, is I'm from Texas. So I'll be translating from Texas to English. There we go. I can do that, by the way. Alhamdulillah. The praise is to Allah, and we thank Him for the opportunity to be here. And we always ask for the peace and blessings to be upon all of his prophets, from Adam to Muhammad sallallahu and for all of those who follow the righteous way till the last day. Then usually we make the statement of Shadu ilaha illallah, which means I bear witness that there really is only one God to worship, and all worship is for him exclusively. And we bear witness to the messengership of Muhammad, and as such to the previous messengers before him. And that, of course, is going to lead us right into our topic tonight, which is the messengership of Jesus the Christ, uh, from the Islamic perspective, of course. As we go along, I want you to remember that you came here to get another perspective, so this should be different from what you know. This is the whole idea. So, um, but in, still there will be things, there are questions, ideas, concepts that come to your mind that you would like clarification on. So this is why they're going to circulate amongst you and hand out to you some paper, just in case you weren't prepared. We are, hopefully. And also pens if you don't have pens. And then if you don't know how to write, we'll get a secretary for you and we'll get your questions and your responses as much as we can before the program is over so that when we end the program, we'll be able to then go into instantly answering the, the questions you have. In the case that we're not able to handle all of them uh, regarding time, because that happens, we do have a website that you can go to to pick up a lot of information there. Actually, a series of websites. And then, in addition to that, we have a place that you can ask questions called Ask Islam at AOL.com. The websites are called Islam Always dot com, Islam tomorrow dot com, and Islam yesterday dot com. <laughs> sort of a sense of a time thing happening here. The one missing is called Islam Today, and that, that was actually our first website, but uh, it, it now belongs to somebody else, so we have the one surrounding it. Um, the, uh, the subject of messengership in general and then we'll come specifically to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. In, in Islam, there is uh, actually more than just the word prophet. There, is, there are two words. One is Nabi, and the other one is Rasul. And all of the messengers are, are Nabis. They fall in the category of Anbiya, prophet, uh, as prophets. That this other distinction called a Rasul is one who delivers our soul. A message. So he's called message. In English, it doesn't carry the status, so I have to explain it to you from the standpoint that the meaning of it. It's a very profound statement to say somebody is a messenger. All of them fall in the category of Andean, but only certain ones are messengers. And those who come with a book or a writing are considered to be messengers. Therefore, immediately you know Moses of course, had his uh, commandments that came on Mount Sinai, so uh, he has to be a messenger because he has something in written form. Many of you do not, don't know that uh, Abraham actually had written message. It became lost over the years, but there is some apocrypha which refers to that, and then Islam, he is considered one of the messengers for having something written, as does... Um, David and Suleiman, because if you'll remember, they had the Psalms attributed to them. In Arabic, they're called the Zabur. <coughs> now, somebody's taking care of the Sheikh, and I like that. That's, that's a good sign. 
मैं तो आप नहीं कहा Some of what I'm going to tell you is uh, known to you already. Some of it I'm going to talk to you about is going to be known to the Muslims. But some of the things I'll talk about tonight, even some of the Muslims won't really be conversant in that. They'll be surprised. They'll learn something. Oh. Some of what I'm going to share with you will be um, where we're alike. We have a commonality. Some things you, you'll do is more like a comparison. And some things may seem strange to you, but that's the whole idea. And I hope you enjoy the program. I do a lot of etymology. As a matter of fact, uh, um, if I were to hang a sign out in front of my office, it would say "etymologist" at large. Now, how many of you know what that word means? All right, this is my kind of university. <laughs> of course, it means I'm a pet doctor. Anyway. <laughs> It's the study of words. It's to take the word and break it down to see where it came from, so that we get a better understanding from it. The word here, as we broke down, was our sala and one who has a message is a rasul, and so that is, of course, what we were talking about first. Now we we'll come to the next prophet after. David and Suleiman, with their Zabur or Psalms, is going to be Jesus, the Christ, peace and blessing be upon him. And then we'll see what is his status according to Islam. According to Islam, we, we have information that says that he has a book. He actually has a book, therefore he is a full messenger. He's a prophet and a messenger. This means that uh, he had something that was with him physically, that's a book doesn't exist today anymore in its original form, but there's a lot of reference to it. And of course the Christians immediately know it as the Gospel. That's what you will call it probably as the Gospel. Or you may call it by its name the Injil or the Evangel. If you know it in the English version it's called Evangel. And in Arabic, Injil. Now, do we have any Arab Christians with us tonight? Anybody here is a, a, a Christian Arab? How about this? Anybody know any Arab Christians? Okay. They have a Bible in their language. Called it, it's, it's called Kitab al-Muqdis. Muqdis or Muqdis, it means holy. The holy kitab or book. And you say holy book. And in Arabic, just like you say holy Bible. Bible is from Kone Greek and it means from Biblios. It means book. It's as simple as that. The word Bible doesn't appear in the Bible. It doesn't appear there. But it appears in the Quran many times. In fact, people who follow the Bible or the book are called the Kitab, people of the book. And the word Kitab in Arabic means book. So Jesus, peace be upon him, is sent with a Kitab or a book. He's therefore a full prophet and a full messenger of God to a Muslim. What we know about him, as Muslims, he fulfills the scripture, the Holy Scripture, since the time of Abraham, and Moses, and David, and Solomon. And this scripture is teaching that there will be one who will come, and he will be of a miracle birth, and he will be a messenger to the people, and he will be in the last days. Pay close attention to this because you'll find that this exactly fits Jesus the Christ. Peace be upon him. First of all, he already came, but he's gone, right? But the Muslims believe he's going to come back. They have no doubt about this. Muslims believe Jesus the Christ will return in the last days. Therefore, he fulfills the scripture that he's coming, he's a miracle birth, he preaches a message, and he's also in the last day. Yet Muhammad, peace be upon him, still fits in there as a prophet and a messenger because he did what? He testified to the messenger before him and all of them before and he also mentioned that Jesus would be back. So there's plenty of room here for everybody. Okay, make sense? Everybody with me so far? The problem that the Jewish have with Jesus 
okay, is that they don't want to accept a number of things. First of all, they don't want to accept that he is the miracle birth. They don't want to accept that the, the immaculate conception. They don't want to accept that he is the prophet. They don't want to accept that he is the Christ or the Messiah. And they don't want to accept that, you know, that he, he did miracles, nor do they want to accept that he's going to come back in the last day. They're only looking for the Messiah to come in the last day, period. That's it. They don't believe that the advent is taking place yet. For the Muslim, they say, no, he did come. He had a miracle birth. He was born to Mary. There was no human intervention there. It's a magic conception. Jesus, peace be upon him, is born. And one of the first miracles is that he actually spoke as a newborn baby and defended his mother against the charges that they brought against her for having an affair or something, you know, and, and he, instead of her defending herself, the baby spoke and startled the people very much. I mean, you know, a, a little baby speaking would uh, shock anybody. But that is what we learned from the Quran, that he spoke and defended his mother. So this is the first miracle, but not certainly not the last. People being cured of diseases, skin diseases, etc. People who were lame, crippled, and so on, being able to walk again. People who were born, born blind, and now they can see. Not restoring sight, uh, which is certainly a miracle in itself. Somebody's blind to see again, but how about somebody that never saw before, and now they can see? That would be amazing. And then even, and we're talking about curing people, how about curing people of death? And he brought somebody back to life who had actually been dead. None of these things um, are normal. These are not things that you could just say, well, you know, it's just a lucky guess, or, you know, no, it's, it's something big. So here is the, the Jesus of the Quran who does all of these things. It's interesting that, that this is mentioned, by the way, in the Bible. And it even talks about prophets before Jesus who did the same thing. Even the bones of Ezekiel were used to bring back the dead. And also that others were cured of blindness and sickness and so on. But the main point here is that Jesus fulfills all of the things that were mentioned in the Old Testament. Where the problem really comes in, as far as the Muslim point of view, that the Jews did not want to accept that Jesus was coming with this message because, in fact, he was very, very hard on them. And if you read the New Testament, you find that he took a whip and he drove the money changers out of the temple. And those being whipped considered that that wasn't very nice. And he kind of put them out of business and probably hurt a little bit along the way. So there was a lot of objection to what he was saying. And he called them vipers, which is, that's not nice, you know, from their point of view. A viper, a snake. And um, also it mentions that he said that if your righteousness didn't exceed theirs, that you couldn't even go to heaven. So the Pharisees, the ones who were charged with the responsibility of the religion uh, for the rabbis, etc. at that time, they were really being put down a lot by Jesus. So you can understand why that they had a real thing to try to discredit him from the beginning. They didn't want anything to do with him and they tried in every possible way to shut down his message and those who followed him. He had quite a following, at, at least from what we understand from the Bible, because it says very clearly that uh, in all four Gospels mentioned this. Now, the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't necessarily agree on every point. They don't, and some of them don't have this part of the story, some don't have that part. Some actually uh, contradict how some of the things happen. But this one particular event is clear and it's on all four. All four Gospels talk about the, what we call uh, uh, the Palm Sunday. Everybody know what it's talking about Palm Sunday? When they laid down the, the palms as he entered, the palm uh, leaves or, uh, you know, the big thing that they laid on the street, and then he rode in on the donkey. And uh, they were laying him down and the saying says, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then he comes in on the donkey. All four of them speak about this stuff. So, it looks like he was well received on that Sunday. And Passover is coming up on the next uh, Saturday, because that was the Feast of the Passover, remember? And at Friday, when the sun goes down, they have to shut down everything, and they can't do anything until the sun goes down on Saturday. So, 
But of course we know he was put on the cross on Friday and they had to get him off of the cross on Friday before the sun went down, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to bury him. Or actually they didn't bury him, they put him in the sepulchre. But the point here is, what happened Sunday, I mean everybody is going for it, but what happened by Wednesday night or Thursday night and, you know, when everything fell apart? Have you ever wondered about that? How could everybody be for you on Sunday and by Thursday they're ready to hang you? What happened? And that's a good question. You can look to some of the apocrypha and you can look to some of the, the recent archaeological finds of some of the texts and try to discover, as I have spent a lot of time with that, and uh, we'll be very candid in telling you that I don't think I found anything out that anybody didn't find before me or after. You can go to Barnes and Noble and buy the books and probably find them a better dissertation on the subject than I came up with anyway. But the point was that they all agree that there's a lot more out there than what we really have today in, in the King James Version of the Bible. So that means that I need to speak about the book a little bit, the Bible, as, as you know it today in English, just to give clarification. The English language didn't exist until the uh, Saxons invaded the, the, Ang the Anglican and, uh, I mean, the England, and when they went in, uh, the Normans invaded the Saxons. We'll go get the story straight. That was in 1066 AD. And after that came what we call the English language. What we're speaking today is a derivative of 950 years of daily changing a language. Prior to 950 years ago, it didn't exist. So that means that none of the revelations that we're speaking about today were actually in the English language. So it would be impossible. That there, is not a, there isn't any way that it could be in the English language. So therefore, anything you read in English is a translation of something. You have to understand that. And the uh, oldest manuscripts that we have from the Jewish text, and we're talking now about the Old Testament, are actually, extant today, are not as old as some of the texts that we have. We have a lot more stuff available, believe it or not, from the New Testament than we do the Old Testament. Did you know that? There's just a whole lot more out there since 2,000 years ago than there is before 2,000 years ago with the exception of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there's a huge question mark on them because there was a big effort to try to make sure everybody would accept these scrolls as being older than 2,000 years ago. Because if they're newer than 2,000 years ago, they got a serious problem. Because nowhere in there did they refer to Jesus and the miracles of the, of the ascension or of the cross or anything else. So it means they have to predate that, otherwise you've got a problem with uh, your particular denomination, what you're trying to preach, because it won't be there. Now, do we have any Bible students here? Anybody who's been through seminary school or know anything about it? First, even first semester. Anybody? Okay. You, everybody heard, you know the Gospels, right? Okay, the first three are called synoptic. And then uh, Johann Gospel stands alone. After that follows, uh, I think something between 12 or 16, depending on who you think wrote them, books are attributed actually to Paul. The majority of the New Testament really, uh, I'm talking about books, is going to rest on Paul. So if Paul is not credible, and that's just a uh, statement of hypothetically, then you would have, you would be missing over half the New Testament. And if it is credible, then you've got a problem with a lot of the Gospels because they don't match. And I'll give you just one example of that so you can think about it. In what we have of the New Testament, and you can find several online, go to Gateway Bible. They've got a lot of research there that you can do in the different versions of the Bible. If you'd like to read it, is the uh, NIV, the KJV, or the Revised Standard, or I think they have about six or eight more on top of that, any of these different versions, and look for yourself. 
you'll find the words are pretty similar to what I'm going to tell you right now. This is Matthew 5, 17 through 20, approximately. It says there that Jesus told his followers, Think not that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but rather to fulfill. And not until all things are accomplished shall a single jot, or a dot, or a tittle, or an iota, now that's going to depend on which translation you have, of the law be in any wise lessened. Whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this, He'll be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches this, he'll be the highest in the kingdom. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter paradise. How many of you are familiar with that passage? Anybody? Did that I get pretty close? I tried it. <laughs> What happened, I read too many different versions of it now, and I'm not sure when I get to this, say this or this or that. The point here is, it seems that the law, because the law here is going to be from the word Torah. Torah or Torah, and it means the Old Testament. It's talking about Old Testament law, speaking about the laws that come, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, Leviticus. And Deuteronomy, that's where you're going to find a lot of the laws that are going to be laid out there. And of course, Exodus is going to talk to you about, the, in chapter 20, about the Ten Commandments. Those laws are not just ten, there are actually hundreds. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laws that are spelled out. So when he says that not even a single one is going to be in any wise lessened or taken away from, then this is something important. When he tells you whoever breaks even one of those and teaches that, that it's okay to do that, that this person is the least in the next life, that's pretty serious. Especially now we'll move to my friend Paul and see what happens. And he tells that he had a blinding light experience. That blinding light experience is mentioned uh, three times in a book called the Acts of the Apostles. And when he tells it the first time, He's talking about having an experience that only he is privileged to, that other people don't hear it, they don't see it. And then he's deaf, or actually blind, that he's not deaf, he's blind, and he has to be taken into the city at Damascus, uh, Damascus, Damascus is called in Arabic, and he has, which is in Iraq by the way, and he has to go there and he has to learn from somebody to get this whole message. But the next time he tells the story, it's a little different. Now all of a sudden people can hear, but they don't see. But in the last time he tells the story, when he's talking to King Agrippa and to Festus, in this case he's trying to convert them, and they even say even that something about you almost make us convert to your, to your religion or some words to this effect. And, uh, or would you have us convert, something like that. In any case, this time, though, he says that everybody heard it, everybody saw it, and he even says they all fell down. So it, there's an inconsistency here, even in his story of his conversion, and the whole thing is very important because it's where he gets his authority for what he's going to tell you. Prior to that, he was doing what? His name was Saul. And who did he work for? Pharisee. He wasn't Pharisee. He was exactly what the verse I mentioned to you is talking about. And now I'm, going to, and I'm taking some, you may wonder where am I getting all this stuff from, right? I'm actually taking it from Hayam Maccabee's work. So, you know, if you've ever read any of his stuff, he talks about the myth of the God incarnate and some things like this. It's a very interesting work. But what we find is that Paul actually did break commandments and teach people that it was okay. And that's why you hear a lot of people today will say that, you know, if you said, well, it's forbidden to eat pork. It's clearly uh, a forbidden thing to eat pork. It says it in the Old Testament. How can you be a follower of the Old Testament and you eat pork? Well, the answer comes that, well, that's the Old Testament. This is the New, Test New Testament. And I've even heard some people say it cancels the Old Testament. If it does, then you don't even need it anymore. You store it away. But without the Old Testament, then you don't have the credentials for Jesus. So you have to keep it attached. So it becomes a bit of a paradox. How are you going to deal with this subject? 
Well, in any case, we're going to come back to our main subject here after I just give you one more example. Paul told the people when it came to the subject of circumcision, which is something the Jews have to do when a boy is so many days old, they have a little ceremony they do, and they remove the foreflesh from his private part, and this is something everybody knows the Jews do that. But did you know that the Muslims also do the same thing? They do. And they have the same command. What happened to the Christians? Well, it's clear in Paul's writing, he said that circumcision is of the heart. Just the heart. So he got out of it. But it doesn't really have a good comparison if you want to approach it just from an outside, say an atheist will look at it. By the way, do we have any atheists with us that are somebody who only could care less about religion? Atheists? Okay. So you can approach it from the from a standpoint of, well, I don't have an investment in any of these religions, so let me take a look at what you're talking about. So when we talk about circumcision, it was only for boys, it wasn't for girls. So it was a law for men. So if it became general and it was only of the heart, then how would you deal with the... Does that mean women also have to circumcise their hearts? Or how come they didn't have to do anything about anything before that? So it becomes a, a, a little bit of a question here. Well, why does this... What is the effect here? Also, when we take it to another level, when Paul says, regarding all law... Now remember, we just quoted a verse that said if you break even one commandment, and it also said that he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Yet Paul said, because of the law, I sin. If it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't sin. Therefore, I'm dead to the law, and the law is dead to me. Anybody ever read that? Am I right or wrong? And I'm not trying to tell you to make a conclusion based on what I said. I'm just saying that those are statements that are there. So from my perspective, and this is just for me to tell you, because maybe you're wondering how could somebody be a preacher and then all of a sudden they're talking about Islam. Well, from my perspective, I wanted to know how can I resolve some of these issues that seem to me very contradictory? How could I on the one hand have a very clear statement in the very first commandment that comes with Moses, God is one, and you have to worship him with no partners. In the first statement. And if you doubt what I said, look in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's the Ten Commandments. Or go to Exodus chapter 20, same Ten Commandments. First commandment is what? And the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of the bondage, you know no God beside me, beside me there's no other God, thou shalt not have any other God beside me. And the New Easy English translation, I don't know what the real name of it is, but, but it's something like the New Easy English. It says real clear, thou shalt not worship any other gods beside you. It uses the word worship, which exactly describes what Islam says. Because the statement, that ilah ha'ilah deals with the subject of ilah, and that means something to worship. And Allah means the only thing to worship. So it's real clear, the statement Muslims make every day says, there is no God to worship besides God. It's just Him. He's the only one to do this worship. So there's the first commandment. This is something that comes, as we said early on, in the very first five books of Moses. And then we find in the New Testament something too. And by the way, there are many quotes. That's not, I didn't give you everything. I'm just saying something you can go look up real quick. Here's another one for you. New Testament. And it's in the Gospels. Mark, which by the way, is considered by most of the scholars to be the very oldest. And if, if there's such a thing, most, based on the most reliable of the extant manuscripts, Mark. Okay? In Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus had been asked about what is the greatest commandment. And he was being asked by one of the, one of the, Pharisees or one, somebody from the from the uh, and he says to them to know O Israel that the Lord thy God is one God and that you have to worship him with all your heart 
and all your mind and all your soul. And he says, I give you a second commandment like it, that you have to love your brother as yourself. <coughs> Everybody familiar with that? Anybody ever heard it? Something like this? I got pretty close. Now, this statement again matches exactly the Old Testament because the, it's not a new commandment that Jesus gave them about loving their brother because that's also in the books of Moses. It's the same thing about loving your brother. The Jews take that, by the way, to mean only somebody of Jewish blood falls in that category. That's why it's forbidden, by the way, for them to deal in interest with each other. With each other. But it's not forbidden for them to deal in interest with non-Jews. Muslims are forbidden to deal in interest, period, regardless. There isn't any kind of an exclusion there that you can sneak around the corner. Just so that you can make a comparison, so that you can see and sum it up now, Jesus, to us as Muslims, is the fulfillment of the scripture. He is miracle birth. He had no father. He was a prophet and a messenger, which there is a distinction to us. He had a book. He is with God. He was raised up by God. He's with God now. And he will come back, just as he left, alive, at the same age that he was when he left. And he will lead the true believers to victory over disbelief and over evil in this world. This is the belief of the Muslim. It's mentioned in the Quran, except for the last part which I mentioned about his return. This is implied by one of the statements in the Quran, but it doesn't say it in clear text. Where we have the clear text is from the prophecies of Muhammad, peace be upon him, stating unequivocally that Jesus will return. Many of his teachings he talked about it, even mentioned where he would come back in Syria, where he would land, and what was going to happen on that particular day, and some of the other events that will be taking place at that time, historical events that some have already just recently taken place. So for the Muslims, we're looking for Jesus at any moment, any moment. Some of the Christians also have an idea that that's real close. So this explains why the Muslim Student Association here felt that this was a very appropriate topic for us to bring up and share with our Christian brothers and sisters so that you can know that we're feeling some of the same things you're feeling, sensing some of the same things that you're sensing, and we're all looking in the same direction. It's interesting to note that the Jews also are expecting their Messiah just about the same time, some similar time. Although they're going to reject the fact that he's already been here, they still are looking for him to come and bail everybody out of the problems we have now. So this gives you a little bit of background and I think certainly opens up now the floor to some good discussion. So I hope that you've had time now to fill out the paper. I see they've been circulating that around. If you haven't done it already, go ahead and start filling those out. And while you do that, I'll bring this part to a conclusion. Conclusion being that for someone who is really searching for the message of Jesus and then looks to Islam, they can find a lot of evidence, strong evidence, to confirm a lot of what's in the Bible. In fact, what I found myself after spending two years of putting the Bible on one side and the Quran on the other, I found eventually that there was no contradiction anymore in the Bible between the Bible and the Quran as long as the Bible didn't contradict itself. I found it to be very totally uh, compatible and in sync with the teachings of Islam and the Quran except in cases where it absolutely contradicted itself. And then he said, oh, there's no such thing. Now, I'll mention it and then you can straighten me out if I'm wrong. I'm going to quote to you from a holy book without mentioning the name of it. And some of you will right away recognize this. It says, in, in the translation, the meaning of it, it says that God doesn't have genealogy. God is not a man. And then it says, and God is not the son of man. Anybody know what book I'm talking about? Anybody? God is not a man. God is not the son of man. Anybody know? Hello? We don't have any Muslims here? Hello? Only one Muslim here. <laughs> Two? Three? 
I'm not married man terrorist came out tonight. I mean Muslim <laughs> What am I talking about? Anybody know what I was talking about? You think I'm talking about Surya Claus, right? Lamb you did. Well I'm you lie, right? Wrong. I wasn't. I was quoting that from the Bible. That's in Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Another translation said that he should sin. Another translation said that he should err. God is not a man that he should sin. And then it says, and God is not the son of man that he should repent. And that's what it says. It's a clear statement. Jesus, peace be upon him, said, according to the Bible, that he was the son of man. So that would be a contradiction if you're going to say he's also God, he's denied it. So, now there are some people, by the way, uh, that will tell you, it doesn't matter what the book says, I already know because I've got it in my heart. Well, this is, you can't argue with that kind of reasoning because if I already have a conclusion in my heart, I don't need any book at all. I'll use a telephone book. It won't matter because I'm not going to change my mind. But if somebody is open up to look and, you know, study, then this, these are things you might want to know about. But now, let's pick on the Muslims for a while. That's enough picking on the Christians. What do you think? No? Yeah. Well, the problem with the, the, that I found uh, with the Muslims is that many of the Muslims don't really know much about their religion anymore. They used to. There used to be some great scholars. But today there seems to be more of an emphasis on trying to take the religion and twist it to be what you want it to be. And I found that even when I visited other countries and talked with scholars, that they were more interested in trying to squeeze the religion to get the result they wanted, rather than to see what does it say. What's, you know, the best way to do it is you just look generally, then look specific. But when somebody goes specific first and ignore the general, then what's going to happen is you're going to, you're going to wind up twisting things. Am I right or wrong? Everybody with me? And so, for instance, I'll give you a good example. I mentioned about dealing in interest, or riba as it's called in Arabic. I just remembered I don't have my glasses in here. Hmm. That was not cool. <laughs> you need somebody to read them? What do you check over here? <laughs> Read that one for me. Okay. You said that Islam believes Jesus had no father? Does it believe that the father of Jesus was God or no? I just wasn't clear on that point. Okay, this is a good question. It's asking that, that I said Jesus had no father. Does that mean God is his father? Okay. Let me be real clear. He has no father. That means he doesn't have a father. That means there's no father. <laughs> no dad. No pop. No paternal relatives. How are we doing? So he's not the son of God? He's not anybody's son except Mary. Mary is his mother. He's called in the Quran, Isa, which means Jesus, Ibn, which means the son of Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary. There's no Joseph. We don't even have a Joseph. Can't even kind of look over at Joseph and go, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you ever read the Matthew, first chapter? Anybody ever read it? First chapter. All right. You sure? Test. Ready? What's the first words? <laughs> it's fair question. And I doubt that anybody's going to tell me. You know why? Because it's boring. <laughs> this is the genealogy of Jesus the Christ. That's what it says. Genealogy means what? Lineage. Lineage. Yeah, exactly. It goes through what, 28 generations? Track 42. Because it says there were 14 generations from it. I'm quoting from the right, end of it. Right. And then 14 generations. And then 14 more. 14, 14, 14. 14. You had them all up. 42. <laughs> Count the names. 43. Oops. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, 
don't don't go to Luke chapter three and read the genealogy over there because it's fifty seven <laughs> between Jesus and David because it's only talking about the David. But it carries it a step further. When you read the one in Luke, it gets really interesting. Because the names don't match. As soon as it says Joseph, the father of Joseph is totally different. And then it goes back with it. And then it comes back together for a while and it's got the same names and then it spreads out and then it comes back together. But when it gets to David, instead of Solomon, it's Nathan the prophet. Now that's a brother to Solomon. So you're going like, wait a minute, what's going on with you guys? I mean, how could... <laughs> You either came from this guy or you came from his brother. Are you, the, uh, are you your own grandpa or are you the son of your own uncle or how does that work? And then from David, the uh, Genesis doesn't do that. Genesis just starts with David and goes to Jesus. But here in Luke, they, they go all the way back to Adam. David is the son of, is it, uh, Pharaoh? And then back, 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 back like this all the way. And then it says Enos is the son of Seth. And Seth is the son of Adam, and Adam is the son of God. That's what it says. Did Adam have a father? Did he have a mother? Why did it say he's the son of God? It's a phrase, isn't it? It's like a like he's this he's the creation of God. Does that make sense? So, if somebody said, we should worship Jesus because he had no father. Well, that's interesting. Let's bring that as a subject. What about Eve? Did Eve have a father? She came out of Adam, so we could say it. But did she have a mother? Whoa! Nope. Wow, I think that's a bigger miracle. I don't know about you, but a man giving birth to me is bigger than a woman giving birth. <laughs> a man with no woman involved is a bigger deal to me than a woman with no man involved. They're both big deals, but still I'm not going to worship her. Are you? I don't think so. And then what about Adam? He didn't have a mother or a father, but I'm not going to worship him, are you? Yeah. It's very clear why you wouldn't do why. You know Huh? They made sins. You can't worship somebody that makes sins, right? So, that's where Jesus comes in as somebody that can be our object of worship because he's perfect. He didn't make any sins, right? Even in Islam, we don't have any sins that we're attributing to him. And every prophet in Islam, we know they made mistakes. We don't say they made like, sins, but they made mistakes. Even Muhammad, peace be upon him, made mistakes. But we don't attribute any to Jesus. But it's not because we consider him to be God. It's because we consider him to still be alive. And it would be wrong to divulge information about somebody who's still living, wouldn't it? I mean, you wouldn't want people to know what you did, would you? Huh? So God didn't divulge anything. We don't know if he did any sins or didn't do, but God's not going to say, well, he did this, he did that, because then he comes back and then, you know, how's that look? Because one of the things in Islam is that God does cover people's sins if they're sincere in their repentance. He doesn't expose people. So that makes it very interesting. We need everything in writing, by the way. So okay, if you can't write, we can help you. No, no, I need it in writing. And the reason, two reasons. One, because if we start that, it gets out of hand. Second reason is it won't get picked up by the cameras anyway. So just write it down. And we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it as quick as we can. We did that one. Okay, next one. Oh, that was a good question. You really gave me a chance to dive into that one. It's an area where I really have the, maybe the most uh, time that I've spent in that area because I was writing a book called That Prophet. But then I found some other Muslims who had written better books, so I stopped writing uh, there. Yeah, they did. They did a better job than what I was really doing. I was, mine was going to be too detailed. I had too, many, too much emphasis just on this word son. That's where I put a lot of emphasis on where that word son was used and what it actually meant in different usage throughout the Bible. Go ahead, read that. What signs or recent events make people believe that Jesus is coming any day now? Hmm. I like that one. Did you hear that? He was saying that somebody asked the question, what signs or recent events 
make us believe that Jesus could be coming any day now. Because I did refer to that. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and death be upon him, told us a number of things to look for in the last days. And uh, one of them that I was just reviewing, it's the first teaching, which is in the collection of uh, uh, Imam Muslim, and it's the second teaching in the collection of over 5,000, no, no, wait a minute, hold on, 3,000, 3,000 hadiths which are mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. So, there, this is right up front, it's like almost the number one thing. And that is talking about when the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and I'll give you the end of the story, it's rather long. And he asked him, he said, the angel is asking Muhammad in front of the people to get the answer out of him. Because the angel doesn't need to ask him anything. But he's asking so that people will hear this information. And he asked him, when is going to be the hour? means when's the last day. And the prophet, peace be upon him, he said, the one being asked doesn't know any more than the one asking. I don't know and you don't know. But the signs are these. And he mentioned two of the signs in that particular teaching. There are many others, but I'll mention these two. One is that the slave will give birth to her own master. And the other one is that when you see the barefoot, destitute, uh, or poor uh, goat herders of the desert, meaning the Arabs, competing with each other to build magnificent edifices in the desert, Okay, I'll come back to that. I want to go back to the lady giving birth to her own master. And we're not allowed as Muslims to say that this actually means this or that means that. We can say you could look at it and think for yourself what it means. Because we're not supposed to try to predict anything. Not even what the rain is going to be tomorrow or snow or anything else. It's, these are things known to God and you say God knows, but it could be this. But have you noticed... And I have because at my age, I'm 61 years old this month, alhamdulillah. And I have a good memory of what, what it was like when I was a child. It was great. This was a great, wonderful country. You have no idea what it was like. We used to leave our keys in the car so that people could move it. That we didn't worry about parking fines. We didn't have that. People could move their car if they needed to go where you were. And if they want to clean the street, like today in New York, they'll tow your car. In those days, you could just move your car to the other side and do whatever they need to do. And nobody would steal your car. That would be unthinkable to steal somebody's car. And leave your house open, because while you're away, maybe somebody needed to go inside. Maybe it would rain or something. Mother used to make up food and put it on the back window sill, and people could come by and take it, because there were poor people didn't have any food. They could just take it. Or they could knock on the door and say we're hungry. And it was common. It was very, very common that you would give food. When anybody wants a ride, they could just stick up their thumb and you would stop, give them a ride, take them someplace. And even if it was out of your way, you would just do that. That was common. That was the decent thing to do. People were very religious. And I mean that not from the sense that they ran around with their Bible trying to convert people, but they actually acted like what the teaching of religion is about. People were kind, courteous, and we were taught real early. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And this is the teaching in Islam. Man kana yukmanu bala wa yawm al akhir yaqulu khayr aw yasmi. But the one who believes in Allah on the last day, either say good or shut up. That's Texas translation. <laughs> but it was a great, wonderful place. It was very strange if anybody cheated somebody. There were cheaters out there. But they were strange. And we used to talk about them like, you know, wow, that's a bad person. And if somebody went to jail, it was like the end of the world. You, you, you just forget it. Somebody had a, a criminal record. And if a girl had an affair with a boy, that was it. I mean, forget that person. She's, she's history. That's just terrible. And people would say, the Bible says, why are you doing that? That's one of the commandments. You can't do that. You can go to hell. And today people go, ha, 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 how many girlfriends do you have? How many boyfriends do you have? <laughs> and even today, you know, how many boyfriends and girlfriends do you have? <laughs> In San Francisco, anyway. <laughs> nope. Just, I mean, you know, you see what's on TV, right? Now I want to come to the point about this slave giving birth to the master. 
no child that I knew, and I knew some kids, you know, pretty mouthy to each other, but I never saw a child talk back to their parents. Never. Even as I grew older and I saw a child speak back to a teacher one time, the whole room went, oh! and we were waiting for lightning to strike the place because the child spoke back to the teacher. And it wasn't long before lightning struck his pants because he got whipped. And they used to do that in class, you know, they had the teachers had a paddle and it was different sizes depending on the teacher and what, how big they are, you know, and just beg you over the desk and whack away, you know. Then all of a sudden they said, you can't do that to kids anymore. But the Bible said, spare the rod and spoil the child. The Bible's right. Whenever there's no corporal punishment, when there is no uh, enforcement behind what you say, what are you going to do? Talk the kid to death? I mean, people try to do that. You know? Well, you shouldn't do that. Don't do that. Oh, you don't really want to do that, do you? Please don't break that. Oh, darn. <laughs> but there's an extreme too, the other way. You know, and, the, and I guess the problem is that people don't realize how Islam provides something nice. Islam, in concept, is two things. It talks about rights. Everybody today talks about rights. But they forget about the other side of it, because Islam gives you both. Rights and limitations. Because there's some limits. If I give you the right to do whatever you want to do, I'm going to have to draw a line somewhere, right? Because I have to give him the same right. How can you have all that you want to do? But wait a minute, he needs his rights too. So if you say, well, I just want to go like this, didn't get you that. Okay. So, but you can't go into his space. Is that right? So it's fair. But people forget to mention that side of it. So what happens when you take these limits away and allow people to go beyond what they're supposed to do, then you get an imbalance in your society. And today, and I'm not talking about today today, I'm talking about 20 years ago actually, I saw it with my own eyes. A woman who had two boys, no husband, and she's trying to provide for them. She's working at her job full time. She came home and she had a box of tennis shoes because it was the first school. And the 12 year old boy opens up the tennis shoes and starts cursing at his mother, telling her something like, you got me Nikes, I told you Adidas, or the vice versa. I think he wanted the Nikes, I can't remember. But I was shocked at the way he treated his mother and told her to put herself back in her car, go back to the place and trade out for the other kind of shoe and don't ever do it again. Because she got him on sale, she was trying to save some money, and he was just basically telling her, I'm not going to school like that. And she did it. She got in the car, went back, got the other shoes and brought them back. <laughs> and apologized to him. What do you call that? Does that sound like a slave giving birth to their own master? I don't know. It sure doesn't sound good, does it? Islam teaches that if children do this to their parents, then all of their worship became canceled. You can fast until you drop dead. And you can stand and pray till you fall over, but Allah is not going to accept any of it. Because the first and foremost thing after your correct belief is going to be your relationship with other people. And go back and see if that didn't what it said in the Bible. And the second commandment, to love your brother as yourself. In Islam it teaches us that you have to prefer for your brother what you want for yourself. And when it says brother here, it's not talking about a male. It's talking about other human beings. And the first human being in Islam is your mother. Because the prophet peace be upon him was asked, after my duty to Almighty God and the commandments that come from the Prophet, meaning the Prophet Muhammad, who is first to have rights on me? He said, your mother. He said, and then who? He said, your mother. He said, and then who? He said, your mother. And then your father. This is a very famous hadith, especially amongst the women in Islam. Am I right or wrong? Any Muslims know that one? Yeah. Is it true? And is that the way Muslims are supposed to? You, after, we're supposed to give this high respect to the mother. 
And when our parents become old as Muslims, we have to care for them. We can't put them in an old folks home. We can't do that. That is not acceptable. Even if they become totally infirm, my own father got Alzheimer's disease to the extent that he couldn't do anything for himself and he had almost no mind at all. And the people that would come to the house, that, uh, you know, because the state sends somebody out every so many days and they don't charge us for that. And we appreciated it. That we liked it because they would come out and tell us tips and things that I care for them. But they would say, why don't you just put him in, you know, put him away. He's not, you can't help him. And he's taking up all your time, he's taking up your resources, and you know, the state will pay for it. Just let it go. We said, we can't. He said, well, he doesn't even know. We said, Allah knows. I know. And somebody here is with him 24-7 that loves him and cares about him. We're going to make sure that he breathes, that he turns over, that he eats or goes to the bathroom and that he eats clean. And when he died, he died right there with my daughter, right there beside him. And she heard his last breath. So there's no way that we have to have a second thought about if I would have been there this or if I could have done so and so or... You no. Know, this, this is how it should be. So when you see the children treating their parents like, like this is the slave for me, telling the parent what to do, just remember that. Now the second part of it. I just got back from Saudi Arabia, by the way, last week. You can't believe the number of buildings and the beauty, the majesty of some of these uh, buildings. The architecture is out of this world. And the height of these buildings would, would scare you. In a desert, I'm from Texas, where land used to be pretty cheap, okay? So we have what we call ranch-style houses. You build out. You never build up. Why? Because it costs more money to build up. The only time you go up is when real estate's expensive, right? Deserts means land is cheap, right? Yeah. So why are these guys building 30-story buildings, 40-story buildings, 60-story buildings, 100-story buildings in the desert? And I asked them a couple years ago when I was over there, I asked uh, this huge building going up from, right across from another huge building. I said, why are you doing it? He said, well, it's an office building. I said, but there's an office building right across the street and it's empty. Nobody even wants to use it. Why are you doing it? He said, so it would be taller. And they call it after their family, like this named after my dad, and I want it to be higher than his, named after his dad. But that's not all. It says about them being magnificent. I visited in one house, and they told us, you know, when you get ready to, to pray, we always wash up. And they have a, a little room right off the main area so that you can go in there and wash up to do that. We went in there. And there, it had a, you know what an island kitchen is, right? Well, this has an island sinks that are around in a circle. The island, right? And they were beautiful. It was so ornate, you didn't want to turn the water on and mess it up. It was so beautiful. It had flowers and stuff coming out of there and this real ornate thing. And I looked at it and I said, that doesn't look like brass. I said, that looks like gold. I said, it is gold. Gold sinks. Now, I didn't use the rest in there, but I heard one of the others come out and he said, the toilet was made out of gold. <laughs> I don't need to say anything there. The joke's already there, right? <laughs> that joke's there. Hello. That, that, is that, I mean, to me, that's a sign. That's a sign of some horrible waste, tremendous waste to consider that anybody would do something like that. And that's exactly what was predicted 1,400 years ago. And keep in mind, up until 60 years ago, those people were barefoot goat herders. And I'm not exaggerating. We have a brother with us from Egypt. He will tell you that when he was a little boy, he can remember his grandfather talking about he used to send all their charity over to Saudi Arabia because if they didn't, they would have starved to death. Am I right or wrong? How many years did Egypt support Saudi Arabia? A thousand years, something like that? Well, I think at least 15, 20 for every year at the time of Hajj. 
the Yeah, the kiswa for the Kaaba was always provided by Egypt. They, they couldn't even, you know, there's a black cover over the Kaaba in the desert, right? There's a black cover over it. That was provided. They couldn't even come up with enough money to buy a cover for it. It came from Egypt. And now they have a gold door for it, by the way. So how could somebody have predicted by accident that there would be such well opulence there that uh, people could do things like that? So this is one of the, the areas of the sign. Some of the other ones I'll go quickly through these. He told us that when the signs come, it will be like when you break a string of pearls, how quickly they run off. Have you ever broken any beads? Try to stop the things from running off. You can't. They're just going to they're going to be gone that quick. And one of the things he told us that in the last days you would see that um, evil would be prevalent everywhere. So evil, and especially for Russia, which is uh, how can I say this? Um, adultery. Illegal sex would be so common that everybody's involved in this. this common. And we're seeing that today. There's no big deal. Turn on Jerry Springer, you feel like an idiot if you don't do something weird. Is that right? It's so common. If somebody says they're a virgin, they would look at them like, whoa. Wow. Call Ripley's, believe it or not. <laughs> Right or wrong? So if you understood what I just said, this was predicted at a time when that's not something considered acceptable. You know, it was predicted and it's happened. Another, I'm going to some of the, I, I'm going to tell you that it's on our website, so you can just go there and get a lot of it. Just hit you with these two that struck me. This is part of a very big hadith or teaching that he had. So this pull this part of it out. He said in the last day the people's extremity oh no, wait a minute. Yeah, we would be communi trying to communicate communicating with the animals of the sea. How about that? Anybody seen what we're trying to do with dolphins and whales right now? Nobody would have guessed that even fifty years ago. But there it is. And we are communicating with the animals of the sea. And by the way, they're animals, those are not fish. 